But Lit on the Roof, if you haven't seen the film, is about a Jewish family in this uh, town of Anatevka, which is in the Russian plains. Funny enough, it's a Russian story. And uh, in the steppes of Russia, uh, little Jewish communities that have been moving across from Israel, from the dispersion, from the exile years ago, and moving towards Europe, but having got stuck in various little towns. And of course they had their own little communities and as Jewish people are, they set apart. So they do their own little thing and the, and the community does their own thing. And uh, it's very, very poor, poor circumstances. And uh, here we will see Tevka, who has got his wife. Um, what's her name again? Uh, uh, Golda, that's right. Golda, where are you, Golda? <laughs> okay. And they've got five daughters. And he has got a cow. And he's the milkman for the town. And so they make their money selling the milk of this uh, cow. And of course, as the kids grow up, he then wants to make sure, obviously, that the girls marry properly. And there's certain traditions and things uh, with that. And so we'll see that. So what I'm going to do is just a three or four minute clip. It's this uh, start of the movie where he actually sings about traditions. And then afterwards we'll discuss it. And I'm going to ask you to, to look at this clip and to see what traditions were they holding on to. This is now hundreds of years after the uh, exile from Israel and they've moved through the whole of Europe and so on, but they're still clinging to certain things. A fiddler on the roof. Sounds crazy, no? But in our little village of Anatevka, you might say, every one of us is a fiddler on the roof, trying to scratch out a pleasant simple tune without breaking his neck. It isn't easy, you may ask. Why do we stay up there if it's so dangerous? We stay because Anatevka is our home. And how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition! 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 of our traditions. We've kept our balance for many, many years. Here in Anatevka, we have traditions for everything. How to eat, how to sleep, how to work, how to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered and always wear a little prayer shawl. This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did these traditions start? I'll tell you. I don't know, but it's a tradition. Because of our traditions, everyone knows who he is and what God expects him to do. Who day and night must scramble for a living, feed a wife and children, say his daily prayers, and who has the right, as master of the house, to have the final word at home? The Papa!
present in the circle of our little village, we have always had our special types. For instance, Yenta the matchmaker. Avram, I have a perfect match for your son, a wonderful girl. Who is it? Rochel, the shoemaker's daughter. Rochel, she's almost blind. She can hardly see. Tell the truth, Avram. Is your son so much to look at? The way she sees and the way he looks, it's a perfect match. <laughs> And Nahum the beggar? Hans for the poor, Hans for the poor. Here, Reb Nahum, is one kopeck. One kopeck? Last week you gave me two kopecks. I've had a bad week. So, if you've had a bad week, why should I suffer? <laughs> and most important, our beloved rabbi. Rabbi, may I ask you a question? Oh, certainly, my son. Is there a proper blessing for the Tsar? A blessing for the Tsar, of course. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu. May God bless and keep the Tsar far away from us. Then there are the others in our village. They have a much bigger circle. His honor, the constable. His honor, the priest. His honor, many others. We don't bother them. And so far, they don't bother us. And among ourselves, we get along perfectly well. Of course, there was the time when he sold him a horse and he delivered a mule. But that's all settled now. Now we live in simple peace and harmony. It was a mule. It was a horse! It was a mule! No, I tell you! It was a horse! Why would I tell you? It was a mule! Horse! Mule! Horse! Mule! Horse! Mule! Horse! Mule! Tradition! Tradition, tradition. Without our traditions, our lives would be as shaky as as a fiddler on the roof. So now, from that clip, obviously, you, there's quite a few traditions that came forward, and so I'd like to ask you what what you actually saw in that as some of the traditions of Jewish people, well, in that period, but even still today, because the traditions are traditions, they keep going, right? So who wants to put up their hand and give me a, a shout and say, uh, what did they see? Let's discuss it a bit. Okay, Christy, what did you they see? They studied the Torah. They studied the Torah, yes. Well, the tradition there is, of course, that the synagogue isn't just a place where you come on a Shabbat. The synagogue is open right throughout the week, and the rabbi is there, and he's teaching. Did you know that you can be taught the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, <laughs> uh, from Torah? <laughs> Obviously, there's the letters that you read, and there's the letters that you copy for writing, and because every uh, symbol has got a numeric value, you can also add up sentences and find out what the, what the tally is. So everything is there. And of course, creation is there. Every aspect of life that you want to know about is actually in Torah, in the Bible. Um, it's the manual, okay? <laughs> And so when you buy a car, you get a manual, and if you don't read it and it breaks down, um, you've got to run there very quickly to find out what happened. And it's really strange in life that people, uh, marriages break down, their businesses break down, their life breaks down, but they haven't got a manual. They do not go back to the maker's manual, right? And that's so important. 
Okay, what other tradition was there? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Very nice. So we, we teach this or show this. I've shown this now in a couple of churches because I want people to be observant about how to recognize Jewish people and also to see what they're doing. If you see a Jewish person with a tzitzit hanging out, I think you all know that, it means that they Torah observant. And the little tassels there, if you count them all up on the four corners of the tzitzit, of the prayer shawl, they should add up to 613, which is the number of laws that they have to try and keep. Okay? So this is a, a Jewish person that is trying to keep the law. And so you can already start a conversation with a person like that. Ah, see, you're, you're a Torah-reading Jewish person. Okay? I think it's, it's good to note that there are so many different uh, categories of Jewish people. Uh, a Jew isn't just a Jew. We all seem to think that Jewish people are just Jewish. Okay? But there's Orthodox, and there's Ultra-Orthodox, and there's Chabadim, and there is uh, Conservative, and there is... Um, Reform, which is very, very liberal, and of course then they're secular. So when you meet a Jewish person, you should actually ask him uh, in which one of those categories do you fall, because uh, let's take an ultra-Orthodox person, um, they feel that if they actually just speak to a goy, a Gentile, they can be defiled. And if you go into an Orthodox guy with his big hat and a coat and all that stuff, and you put your hand out to say, Hi, I'm Jack from Cape Town. You'll go like this and walk away. <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't want to talk to you. He doesn't want to touch you because you are going to defile him. Okay? Is that good or bad? No, it's stupid, actually. <laughs> And we need to, to talk to these people to say that, you know, the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. And none of us are better and higher than other people. And uh, it's really a silly thing. But uh, you can't say that on the first meeting. Okay. Go and give my... Yeah. Okay. So... There's these finer points that, that we all have to, to learn about as we, we go, go into this field. Well, the whole story of Fiddler on the Roof is this fiddler who's, who's very precariously balanced on this roof. And he's playing his fiddle and he's trying not to fall off at the same time. And he's using the, the metaphor of, of uh, traditions to give us balance in life to give us identity in life. Did you hear what he said? We know who we are. And he also said we know what to do. Because in, in, the, in the Torah uh, world view, it's a lot of what do you have to do. It's a do religion, okay? And uh, the faith thing comes more in the new covenant. So you've got the Old Covenant and New Covenant. We're going to discuss it later, what's the differences between them. But you can already see some of the things coming to the fore. So there's it. Gives you balance, gives you direction, gives you identity. There's these roles. Did you see the roles that the, the fathers have certain roles? Yeah, that's right. The father is the head of the house and he's got responsibilities and and you saw the kid running in late for, for class in the, in the synagogue. And uh, he's, it says that at the age of three, they start learning to read and write and do things. At the age of ten, they learn a trade. Okay? Because if you want to do something useful and for the community and earn money, you have to learn a trade. How many of you know that um, in the earlier parts, let's say up to the 1500s, from the time of, 
of, uh, let's say, the New Testament and the new 300 years afterwards with Constantine um, and the church, that the church was actually the founder of um, places of higher learning. So what we would say technicons or universities and stuff belong to the church. And did you know that they would not allow Jewish people into the universities? Mm. And so up to the 1500s, and this, this is obviously now a bit later period than that, but if you were a Jewish person and you wanted to get ahead, you couldn't have a profession. You couldn't be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker. Or, my, my banker, yes, but Krista, you could be a banker. Eh? You could be a... <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, that, uh, that sort of held them back tremendously. And, uh, you know, we must realize that, that these people struggled for a life. And it's only after the Reformation that universities opened up for Jewish people. And immediately they became doctors and engineers and lawyers and things like that. And they did very well. And then they excelled in the professions again. And, but one thing they were always allowed to do, and that was work with money. Why? Because the church considered money to be evil and dirty. Okay? So you know what? Those Jews, they can do the money, but not the other stuff. <laughs> okay? And so now you get the backlash. Uh, you know those Jews, those, those terrible People, man, they're always just money, 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 and then the banks, and then, hello, that's all they could do. That's all you allowed them to do, so don't hold that against them. If they're good financiers and good money people, it's because they were, were held into that position. So we should also remember that in our discussions with them. Um, we'll get to that a bit later, but... Did you see the kid eyeing the little girl around the corner? <laughs> and who's the, the big person that's going to come into his life later on? What's she called? Matchmaker, yeah. <laughs> the mother's going to say, look, my daughter is ready. Uh, who can she marry? Okay, and then we'll discuss it later as well. Um, what else is there? Yeah, for us... That's right. So for, for them, they understand it. Some of them, as he quite rightly said, they don't even know where it comes from. Um, and of course, there's other traditions that they do hold. And I must say that in this little discussion is that not all traditions are good. All right. And not all their traditions are good, for sure. Um, there's a tradition, even in Shabbat, if you go to a Shabbat with a Jewish couple, you're going to read the uh, liturgy, and in the liturgy they're going to talk about the Queen of Heaven. Anybody come across that? Yes? Yeah, the Queen of Shabbat, or the Queen of Heaven is the Queen of Shabbat. And of course this is a throwback to, uh, to, to idol worship, in fact. And of course, uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah and these people are warning them to stop uh, worshipping in the high places Ishtar. And that's the, the Queen of Heaven. And uh, it's very much, you know, mixed up. And that's why when, when the Pope and Mary and the Mother of God and all those things come to, to the fore, it's not such a big deal for the Jewish people to meet with him and to, to have inter, um, uh, what do you call it, religious things because there's some points of contact there. And they were warned against that and they still have that. And of course there was the Queen of Heaven and of course the baking of raisin breads. Okay, <laughs> which, <laughs> which we now have as a tradition <laughs> in the form of hot cross buns. Eh? So you see where all these things come from. Now in the Bible it also says that men are not to cover their heads, but they wear a kippah and they cover their heads and that's a tradition 
And you ask them where it comes from, you don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's actually wrong. It's not biblical. The women should cover their heads and the men should not cover their heads. That's what it says in the Bible. So you've got to be careful about tradition and uh, to what extent, um, which one it is, what's the source, and even in our own traditions. Okay, and I was just going to say that I just recently read a survey that somebody did in Israel to say that the traditions are also falling away tremendously. Um, 60% this person broke it down by category of, uh, of what kind of Jewish person it was, Orthodox, Ultra-Orthodox, all those other things I mentioned, 60% um, of Jews in general do not keep the traditions. It's quite a lot, eh? Yeah. And 60% and of them don't read Torah. Actually, this is the point I'd like to make because if you're ever in discussion with Jewish people, you're going to find out that they don't know the Bible. They don't even know the Old Testament because they're reading Talmud, right? And Gemara and all the other commentaries on the Bible. When a Jewish guy goes to um, Shiva to, to the school, a religious school, he is discussing what the rabbis discussed about Torah, but he's not reading Torah. So, um, just to illustrate this point about them not reading the, the Bible, as we would call it, we, did, we do outreaches in Seapoint, or we did, now it's different. The, the blocks of flats used to be open, you can just walk in, uh, no big gates and things like now. And of course you go to speak to a Jewish person, you look for what on the door? Mezuzah. If there's a mezuzah, then you know, okay. And uh, you make as if you're not targeting them. <laughs> okay. You're going around talking to people about Jesus and you knock on the door. And obviously some of them don't let you in and others do. And so this one lady actually um, let us in. And we were talking about things and the Bible and so on. And uh, we, uh, we were talking about Abram. The discussion came around Abram and the fact that Abram was asked to offer Isaac. And then at that point, something else happened in the discussion. I think there was a picture of the Holocaust survivors in the room. And then she went completely ballistic, which a lot of them do, and for good reason. Do you expect me to believe in God? Look what he did. That was my mother and my father, and, my, and they're all dead in the Holocaust. What kind of a loving God is that? And like, end of the story, get out, you know. <sighs> Tricky. <laughs> and you also... After a while, you have to learn what to say in those circumstances. You were confronted with that, what would you say? Luckily, I didn't have to say anything because she kicked me out, okay? <laughs> but as I was going out, she said, stop. I said, what's it now? She said, so what happened to that uh, Isaac and Abram thing? <laughs> she was concerned the father really had to kill the son, you know. In other words, she didn't know. She didn't know because they don't read the Bible. The women less even than the men. But the men are constantly arguing about Rabbi Atikva said this and Rabbi Akia said that and but that Rabbi said this and Rabbi whatever in that century said that. So that is the Talmud, it's a commentary on the Bible and what everybody else says. And by the time they finished arguing, nobody knows anything. Okay. All right, there's a bit of background. Right, let's do the next one. Next one you should know quite well, which is something on the Shabbat. Um, uh, you know that there's a Shabbat liturgy as well. Um, but now in this particular case, they're not doing the whole Shabbat. There's a song that they sing in the movie um, concerning Shabbat and the blessing of Shabbat and so on. And it's a very, very moving song. <laughs> 
really, and I, I wish we knew the words that we could actually use it. Protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining. them from the strangers ways May God bless you and grant you long life. May the Lord fulfill our Sabbath prayer for you May God make you good mothers and wives Husbands who will care for you. May the Lord protect and defend you. May the Lord protect and defend you. May the Lord preserve you from pain. May the Lord preserve you from pain. Favor them, O Lord. Favor them, O Lord. Happiness and happiness for you. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so as you can see, we when we go to other churches, not yours obviously, that has a very good concept of, of Sabbath and, and uh, holding Shabbat and holding Shabbat as a family, um, that this is actually quite fremd, uh for ordinary churches. And, you know, you have to just... Talk to them in love about Shabbat because I don't think there's any greater and more wonderful thing than having your family together on a Friday evening and just breaking bread together and, uh, you know, celebrating the joy of Shabbat. It is the most amazing thing. And for the children to have the blessing, you saw in that song there, the blessing to the children, the five daughters on the one side and a couple of boyfriends on the prospective uh, people on the other, and they're there and they invited and keep us from the strangers' ways. Isn't that amazing? They're living in a, in, a, in a town where the strangers are also living and they're doing all the other things, you know, and um, they have to be set apart because God's people are in fact set apart. And as Anne read to you in Ephesians 2, um, the message there is that we, as the, in the nations, we of the, the Goyim, the, the Gentiles, were once far away from God. We were far away from this sort of thing. And he has brought us near. And so that those are in Messiah, Jew and Gentile in Messiah, become one new man. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And we really, we must, we must pray that you have some Jewish people that come to the Lord. I know there's few in George, but actually come and sit with you here as Jew and Gentile believers in in one uh, room and in one celebration. And very often when we do Shabbats now in Cape Town, we have four or five Jewish people, uh, Messianic believers that actually come. And uh, the thing just makes a lot more sense in a way, but I don't want to deter you. You keep on and you keep on and you invite other people because Shabbat is a blessing. There's no question about it. And so the depth of that. 
And of course, the fulfillment of Shabbat in Yeshua is the fact that we have one day a week in, in, uh, in Torah as the Shabbat. And according to Hebrews 4, we now enter into not only one day of rest, but into His rest. In other words, it's a forever rest. It's almost like the Garden of Eden. You must remember we're all going back to the Garden of Eden. And God created, in, in the sixth day, created uh, man and woman. And together they entered into Shabbat. But a forever Shabbat. They didn't start on the Monday working again and making new things. <laughs> okay, They were finished. And so we also in our spirit life should be finished with the work that we're doing in the spirit side in the sense that we are one uh, with Messiah in his Shabbat, in his rest. And we enter into a deeper level of rest than just a one day rest. Okay, now... Um, there's quite a lot of songs you could have chosen, but I've, I, I did this one. It is Tevya asking his wife, do you love me? Okay. And uh, it's, it's a good place for all, all of us, actually, because um, being in love with somebody and married to somebody can also become a tradition. Okay. And so sometimes... You have to ask the question, so let's see what he says here. Golda, do you love me? Do I what? Do you love me? Do I love you? Well? With our daughters getting married and this trouble in the town, you're upset, you're worn out. Go inside, go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. Uh, no, Golda, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? You're a fool. I know. But do you love me? Do I love you? Well... For 25 years I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked your cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? Golden, the first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared. I was shy. I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we'd learn to love each other. And now I'm asking, Gold, do you love me? I'm your wife. I know. But do you love me? Do I love him? Well? For 25 years I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? And you love me. I suppose I do. And I suppose I love you too. It doesn't change a thing. But even so. After 25 years It's nice to know <laughs> Really uh, a wonderful insight there. Now, don't you find it strange that it's the husband asking the question? <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know, but in our marriage is definitely, I think, only asking me to come up with, uh, to break through that big, thick dome that I've got around me and to actually say the words. And it's, it's very often quite difficult to say. 
even after 47 years. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was thinking about this song in the sense that um, we, can, we can do things together. That's what Tevia said in the beginning there about tradition. God tells us what to do. Well, they find the traditions egging them on into what they have to do, the roles they have to play, the stuff they have to do, the children they have to bring up. And is that the essence of it? Is that the essence of it? So let's, let's for instance, it's just a bizarre thought came to my mind that if you were sitting next to your boss, okay, and you asked your boss or your boss asked you, do you love me? You could almost answer the same things. But I've been working here for 15 years. Are you mad? Of course, uh, I love you. Maybe that's, you know, it sounds a bit harsh to say, but you understand what I'm trying to say? You're working there, you're doing things, and he's, you're doing things for him, he's doing things for you, he's paying you, you're running around the desk uh, all day long doing the admin stuff and this and that, and you go to the bank for him, and, and he does that for your kids or whatever, and you could say, is that a love relationship? Because they're working together and they're doing stuff together. <laughs> And so you could take it even a step further. You could say, for instance, if I'm doing things for God, and God came to me and said, do you love me? And uh, I could answer, gee, how could you ask me? I mean, I've been a diakon since 23. <laughs> And then I became an elder. I had to wear that black suit for about 10 years. <laughs> and then I've done this ministry and I've been running around the world doing this stuff and going to Israel and all this. Lord, of course I love you. Do you love me? Or are you doing things for me instead of being in love with me? You know, there's, there's a deeper level than the doing, doing, doing thing. And I don't even know if we've actually reached that and at what stage do we reach that? Is, is, do we reach that when, when we sit alone and our thoughts are on Him? And uh, when we're praying and we're praying tongues or when we're asking for things and just realizing that we're not just going to do things, we're going to get the answer from Him first. And so it's like a huge difference. And I'm not ask, uh, asking myself today, have we got to that level of love, or is it the busy level of love? Okay? So I'm going to play that clip again, Johan, will you mind playing it again? And if you're a husband and wife, or you, you're going in that direction, will you sit, Rina, go and sit next to Krista? <laughs> I happen to know this cap couple, and they are married. <laughs> and hold each other's hands. And I'll come and do the same with Andy, and we'll play that song again. And let's just see where that takes us. John just says, put up the last one for us. So, excuse me for being a bit sentimental, <laughs> but I think that was a question well asked. Okay, this, this last part is, um, yeah. This is the part where the town gets, gets new orders from uh, the Tsar that the Jewish people have to leave. And it's always been a bit of a tense thing because it's us and them in the community. And uh, now it's come to a head and they were told to leave and they have to leave their houses and their homes and everything just like that, uh, like the Jewish people have done many, many, many times already in the history of the world. And uh, let's just have a look how that, that plays out. It's a very short clip. 
and then we can just discuss that quickly for the last uh, effort there. Yeah. Okay. Well, Anatevka hasn't exactly been the Garden of Eden. That's true. After all, what have we got here? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. A pot, a pan, a broom, a hat. Someone should have set the match to this place years ago. A bench, a tree. What's a house? Or a stove. People who pass through on that Tefka don't even know they've been here. A stick of wood. A piece of cloth. What do we leave? Nothing much. Only a Tefka. Just a place. You know, forefathers have been forced out of many, many places at a moment's notice. Maybe that's why we always wear our hats. There we are. That's the rabbi taking the Torah scrolls with him. He wouldn't leave that behind. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, the that's story of the Jewish life, actually. If you think of all the pogroms and the inquisitions and everything else that's happened to them, then they've had to pack up at a moment's notice and to leave. And it's only now, 1948, that they've got their own country back again and that they can settle down and, and fight for themselves because They've always had to rely on other people fighting for them and then they never came. And so there's these horrible stories and most of the stories are, unfortunately, about Christian people persecuting Jewish people. And the reason for that is that there's still a belief, even to this day, that the Jews killed Jesus and that's why they deserve to die. They had their chances and God will never look on them again. So, obviously, that is such a wrong interpretation of Scripture, it's unbelievable. We all know that it was ordained for the Jewish people to actually crucify Christ. And to, for, the, for the blood sacrifice to have come, uh, it was necessary for the high priest to sacrifice Jesus. And so... These very same people, if you had to ask them, okay, if they didn't kill Jesus, then tell me, uh, would you be happier? 
Would you like to go to a grave in Jerusalem somewhere where Yeshua's body is lying, he died of old age? That wouldn't work either. So it's a, it's a huge responsibility to have had that responsibility of taking the Son of God and uh, condemning him to death and having him crucified and uh, for the high priest to take him out and to hand him over uh, to be crucified. And so that is part of what God wanted of them. It's just like Abram when he had to sacrifice Isaac. Do you realize that Abram was over a hundred years old and Isaac was about twenty odd and no hundred year person could have caught a son of that age. So Isaac had to lay down his life willingly in obedience to his father. And so it's an amazing foreshadow of what Jesus also had to do. And so it's really wrong of anybody to accuse the Jews uh, for killing Jesus or to hold it against them when Jesus himself said on the cross his last words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so that is such an incredibly wrong thing. But of course, if the devil knows that you are the upholder of the faith, the banner of God, the place where his name is written, then what would you do? Obviously, you would try to destroy that very image. And if, if uh, this terrible adversary of ours had got it right to kill all the Jews with Hitler, with Haman, with all the other inquisitions and stuff, uh, and the final solution had been the final solution, then we would have finally have to have thrown away our Bibles. Because God has a plan and the purpose for Israel is not finished with them. He has even got a covenant with them which he hasn't broken, even if they are in unbelief and his name will be glorified in the end and they have still very many very difficult things ahead of them before that actually happens so we need to pray for the Jewish people they they are again in a situation which I, I dread for them because they are again turning to other nations for help and assistance like Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Qatar and all these ungodly places and God, ungodly people uh, for help and assistance. And they're doing the most incredible stuff that I don't even want to talk to you about, the gay parades in Jerusalem, the abortion rate that's over two million children already been aborted since 1948, and so on and so on and so on. So, you know, God still has to work with them. And they still have to get to that place where Zechariah says that they will call out to the one that they have pierced. And they will mourn for him like one who mourns for their only child. And so that hasn't happened yet, but they're surely on their way uh, to having that happen and to, for that happening. And in the meantime, it looks like they're getting more worse than, than they've ever been. And every guy that you think can think of that, that's doing things wrong, like the Zuckerbergs and the uh, whatever, these, all these guys that are in charge these days of this new world order that they're trying to force on us, are mostly Jewish people. And so people are going to turn against the Jewish people even more. But we must remember, God is a covenant-keeping God. And he will not forsake or leave them. And he will look after them even in their unbelief because that is his plan and his purpose. And right at the end, it says, Paul says, and all Israel will be saved. And it's unfortunately the remnant of Israel that will be saved you said. And so we must pray for them. We have to keep them in our prayers. They are still God's people. And as I said, if they disappeared, we would have to tear up our Bible 
There's so many things where Israel is still involved with and we must never forget those words of Jesus himself where he says, and I will not return until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so they have to call on Yeshua to return. And they're only going to do that in dire straits and, and need. And uh, so we can look out for that.